Many of us realize that being a woman, there are certain dangers that we are constantly on the lookout for. We are told to only go out alone during the daytime, and if you go out at night, stay in groups. Always stay in public places. Always be aware of your surroundings. If you want to exercise outside, only wear one headphone. Don't look down at your phone. We need to be vigilant and focused to make sure that we are not victims of violent crimes simply because we are trying to exist as a woman. But sometimes, even when we take all of those precautions, so many women still fall victim to violence at the hands of entitled, psychotic men. That is what happened to Ashling Murphy, and just as so many of these cases are, her story ends so tragically, so brutally, and for absolutely no reason beyond that she existed in a public space as a woman. This is Ashling's story. Ashling Murphy was born to parents Kathleen and Raymond, and she was the youngest of three, with a brother named Cathal and a sister named Amy. She grew up in Blue Ball, Ireland, which is a small rural village just over an hour away from Dublin. She was described as outgoing, intelligent, and dedicated. She had such an amazing drive and always wanted to accomplish whatever she put her mind to. Ashling grew up with a love and appreciation for music, which started at a young age because she was surrounded with music growing up. She grew into a talented musician herself, taking after her father, playing the fiddle and tin whistle. She was described as just having a natural talent for these instruments, playing older-style traditional Irish music. In school, she was part of the youth choir and senior orchestra with the Coltis Keltori, playing all over Ireland and the UK on tours. As she grew older, even with going to school and eventually getting a job, she continued playing music at home with the family every Friday and Saturday night. Music truly brought the family together, and Ashling loved showing off her talents to her loved ones. Ashling went on to graduate from Mary Immaculate College in Limerick before accepting a job as a first grade teacher in Duro National School. According to those who knew her, she was the most amazing teacher you could possibly want. She was creative, energetic, and passionate. Her students loved her, and there was no shortage of people who had amazing stories just about how wonderful of a person Ashling was. When Ashling came to Doro National School, there was a great expectation as to what she would bring and how she would contribute to um, the culture that was there. She was a perfect fit for Doro School. We were big into traditional music and uh, trad groups, and Ashling had all of that, but she also had all the qualities you could possibly imagine or look for in a perfect teacher. Boundless energy, kind, caring, sensitive, creative. My memories are of a very open, um, an open girl, a very warm girl, someone who was very giving, someone who um, shared her gifts, very heavily involved in Kyoltis. Um, she also played on the pitches of Mary I. You know, she went from being a great student during the week to then teaching music at the weekends. So she never stopped. She was a hard worker, but she enjoyed the work. She was passionate. She was passionate about education. She was passionate about music. And she combined those things in a very beautiful way. Nobody will forget Ashling Murphy. At the time, 23-year-old Ashling had a boyfriend named Ryan, who she had been dating for six years. The two had actually met when they were only 15 years old and had dated for a few months, but then they broke up, only to get back together when they were a bit older and more mature. They said that they were just too young for a relationship when they first met, but ended up back together when they were in their late teens. By all accounts, the two had a loving relationship full of love, trust, and respect. It was a simple, non-complicated relationship between two people who were head over heels for one another. The two frequently discussed marriage, children, and what the future held for the pair. By around 3 p.m. on the evening of January 12, 2022, Ashling left from school where she worked that day and decided to go on a jog at the Grand Canal in Tillamore to get some exercise. This was a very common thing for Ashling, as she was very into fitness and loved running and walking along that canal whenever she got the chance. The Grand Canal is also a very well-trafficked area for runners and walkers. It is a flat, smooth path that makes it easy to get your daily exercise in. 
According to Ashling's mother, however, she was a bit nervous for Ashling to go out that evening. Apparently, she asked her not to go, but Ashling assured her mother that she was 23 years old and she could handle herself. So, off she went. However, not even an hour after starting her run, local authorities received a call from two other joggers who were running along the opposite side of the canal as Ashling. They didn't have their cell phones on them, so the two women ran to the nearest home that they could find and asked the man who lived there if they could use his landline, and of course, he let them in. In the call to authorities, the two very distressed women said that they just witnessed a horrific attack. They said that just a few minutes prior, they saw a man viciously attacking another jogger. The man had been standing over a woman lying on the ground, slightly covered in the nearby shrubbery. She was kicking and fighting and was clearly being attacked. Police in Ireland are called Guardi Shahana, meaning guardians of peace. So, I will be referring to the authorities as Guardi for the sake of the video. Either way, when the Guardi arrived to the scene on the canal, they found Ashling lying on the ground next to the path in some shrubbery. She was actually down a little bit, down an embankment in a little bit of a ditch. She was covered in blood, with blood all over her face and neck, and her hair was all matted up from all of the blood. At first, paramedics couldn't tell exactly what happened to her other than the fact that she had been brutally beaten. Paramedics spent about 10 minutes attempting CPR and doing anything they could to save her life, but unfortunately, she was already deceased. Once they got Ashling's body on the stretcher to transport her to the hospital, that is when first responders saw that she had numerous small puncture wounds to her neck. Upon later reports from the medical examiner, Ashling had suffered from 11 stab wounds, mostly to the right side of her neck. Her voice box was severed, which made it impossible for her to speak or scream out for help while she was being attacked. There were also possible signs of strangulation, but the medical examiner couldn't make that determination for certain. Ashling also had signs of lacerations to her hands and fingers, which suggested that she fought off her attacker with everything she had. It was thought that she tried using her keys as a way to defend herself, but obviously, this did not work. Because of how many times she had been stabbed, she bled out so much that her body went into cardiac arrest. That was listed as her official cause of death. She was murdered by being stabbed, most likely with a small knife with a serrated blade, and then bled out, causing her cardiac arrest. At the scene when Ashling's body was found, authorities found her cell phone in her jacket pocket. They also found a pair of sunglasses on the path several feet away from her body. Then, they also found a distinctive neon green bike close by the path. Of course, after finding Ashling's body, Gardy started the investigation. They knew that they were looking for just one assailant since the entire attack had been witnessed by two other joggers but by the time the guardy got there, he was nowhere to be found. So, the first thing investigators did was speak to anybody who was on the path that day to see if they could get any more information about the suspect. There was one witness named Emma who told Guardy that she and her parents were walking their dog on the Grand Canal just after 3 p.m. that day. They said that while on the path, they saw a woman jogging around the corner with a man on a bright green bicycle following closely behind her. Emma thought that maybe the two were together, but then the cyclist passed the woman. Emma described that the cyclist was wearing a black tracksuit top with dark tracksuit bottoms that had a red logo. He had a tight crew cut, striking eyes, and yellowish skin. She did not think that the man looked Irish. He looked to be some sort of immigrant. Later, after returning back home from her walk on the canal, Emma actually overheard a conversation from another witness who was on the canal that day. This witness's name is Jenna. Jenna told Emma that she had seen a woman being attacked on the canal. She saw a man on a bike go up to the woman before attacking her. Jenna said that she yelled at the man to stop, threatening to call Guardy, so this man looked at her and told her to F off. So, now police knew that the bike that they found near the path and near Ashling's body had to be connected to her murder. Next, police looked at cell phone evidence that they gathered from Ashling's phone. 
at the time of her running, she was actually wearing a Fitbit to track her exercise. Investigators were able to use this information to give them a very clear picture of when Ashling was murdered. According to the Fitbit, she started her run at 2.51 p.m. The GPS information showed her traveling from her car to the actual path. At that time, her heart rate was at around 100 beats per minute, raising up a normal amount consistent with physical exertion until 3.21 p.m. Between 3.01 and 3.20 p.m., she had run 3 kilometers. At 3.21, her heart rate started showing wild erratic fluctuations in heart rate and the GPS showed that she was not traveling any more distance at that time. By 3.31 p.m., 10 minutes later, it appeared that her heart stopped beating. So, this gave investigators a very clear and concise time of the attack. After this, police combed through any and all CCTV footage from around the area to see if they could find any footage that captured Ashling or her attacker. In total, they combed through just over 25,000 hours of security video. So, between the hours of 12.25 p.m. and 2.05 p.m. on the day of Ashling's murder, police found footage of a man riding around various locations around Tullamore on a bicycle that matched the bicycle found at the scene. The man on this video was also seen wearing a black hoodless sweater with black sweatpants that had a stripe on the side. At 1.38 p.m., an unknown woman wearing a maroon jacket is seen walking on Church Road in Tullamore. Then, there's a man on a bike seen following just behind her. It appears as if he is staring at her and following that woman around. At 1.53 p.m., the man is then seen stopping his bike at Hop Hill Grove in Tullamore. He gets off the bike and reaches into his pockets and then brings both arms out in front of his body and he appears to be holding something, but the footage was too grainy to tell what he was holding. At 2.05 p.m., the man is not seen on CCTV footage again until around 8.55 p.m. At that time, he is seen once again riding around on his bike wearing the same black jacket and black pants with a white stripe. At that point, Gardy had a good idea of what the man who attacked Ashling was doing in the hours before the murder. He was mindlessly meandering around Tullamore, staring at other women and following them around. But none of the footage was clear enough or specific enough to get a positive identification on this man. However, by January 13th, 2022, just one day after Ashling's body was found, the case had a breakthrough. That evening, a 33-year-old man named Joseph Puska was admitted to the St. James Hospital in Dublin with injuries to his stomach. For some background, Joseph Puska is originally from a small village in Slovakia. He left school by the age of 16, never finishing secondary school. Throughout his life, he spent some time living in the Czech Republic where he worked as a construction worker for buildings. By 2015, he moved to Dublin, Ireland. At that time, he decided to settle down with his wife and the two went on to have five children together. While in Ireland, he continued working as a builder before he hurt his back and could no longer work. At that point, he started receiving disability checks and was no longer working. Now, while at the hospital through an interpreter, he told the medical staff that he was in Blanchardstown the previous day, January 12th, where he had been stabbed multiple times. Basically, he gave the story that he got a ride from Dublin to Tellamore the previous day, January 11th, at around 3 p.m. He said that the next day on January 12th, he flagged a taxi to Blanchardstown, but when he arrived and got out of the taxi, two men started following him. He said he was then stabbed multiple times by the two men in broad daylight. After that, he went to his parents' apartment to let them know what happened, but he had no memory of how he got there. After arriving to his parents' house, he said that he was injured and had very clear scratches all over his hand. There was clear evidence of puncture wounds to his abdomen, so at the hospital, he underwent exploratory surgery. For this procedure, he was given morphine for pain management. The exploratory surgery ran from around 8 p.m. until 10 p.m., and during that time, the doctors found that his injuries were not significant or fatal. 
but Joseph stayed in the hospital for the following few days to continue treatment. Now, while this was happening, Gardy went to the hospital to speak with Joseph about the whole story that he gave them about being stabbed by those two random men. These officers went to the hospital to question him, and after getting his statement, the officers went back to Blanchardstown to follow up. But after starting this investigation, they realized that there were a lot of pieces to this puzzle that just were not adding up. They started to wonder if this man could be connected to the murder of Ashley Murphy. Gardy then returned back to the hospital, and on the morning of January 14th, they spoke with Joseph once again. This time, Joseph was a bit more specific with his story. He talked about how he went from Tillamore to Dublin before hailing a cab to Blanchardstown. Police asked him why he was going to that area, and he said that he was going there to meet up with a woman named Maria, who is from Hungary. Gardy asked him if his wife knew about him meeting up with another woman, and he said no, and that he didn't want her to find out. It turned out that Joseph had also been on multiple dating sites, obviously behind his wife's back. The guardie then asked him if he had owned a bike, and he said yes. The officer asked him if he rode his bike on the day of Ashling's murder, and he said that he hadn't ridden his bike in over two weeks because it had been stolen. He asked if he had ever reported the theft, and he said no. But at that point, the officer could tell that Joseph became nervous. He was visibly upset and even started dry heaving. After this line of questioning, police left the room to give him some time to himself. I also want to note that based on the CCTV footage that I discussed a minute ago, police realized that the man in the hospital looked very similar to the man who was riding around on his bike all day leading up to the murder. Again, he was in Tullamore, he wasn't in Dublin or Blanchardstown, he seemed to be in Tullamore pretty much all day. But by 6 p.m. that evening, using the information that we discussed so far, Guardy officers had received a warrant to seize Joseph's clothes and his cell phone. So, officers went back into the room with Joseph and explained the situation to him. Joseph asked if he was a suspect, and Gardy explained that he wasn't, that he was just a person of interest. This was all done with the interpreter on the phone. Just a few minutes into the conversation, according to the interpreter, there was then a long pause in the conversation. Then, out of nowhere, Joseph said to the interpreter, Please tell him everything exactly as I tell you. Please tell that I did it, that I killed her. But please tell him also that I did not do that intentionally. Tell him that I did not want to do it and that I am sorry that I did it and that it happened. And that is exactly what the interpreter told the officers. Now, Joseph did speak some English, so in English, he then told officers, I'm sorry, I see a girl I never see before. Knife I use for chain. When I pass, I cut her. I cut her neck. She panic, I panic. He then said, will I go for 10 years? Then pointed to his abdomen and said, I did this. So basically what he's saying is that he saw her on the path. He sort of just stabbed her out of nowhere. She was freaking out. He was freaking out. And then later he stabbed himself in the stomach so that he could, I guess, come up with a story of how he got scratches on him. Or I don't really know what his goal was with this story, but Again, he was saying that he stabbed himself after stabbing her. Officers were stunned at that point. They warned Joseph that he had access to a lawyer if he wanted, and Joseph said that he understood. After the confession was made, Joseph seemed very concerned for the safety of his family. He asked if the names of his family members will be made public and if it's possible that Ashling's family will want to take revenge on his family for what he did but the officers assured Joseph that there would be no retaliation against his family. Because of this confession and the other evidence that they had, by January 18th, Joseph was released from the hospital and immediately, Gardy arrested Joseph and charged him with Ashling's murder. But to their surprise, even though he made a full confession, Joseph actually pleaded not guilty and was now changing up his whole story. 
The original trial date was set for June of 2023, but it was delayed until very recently in October of 2023. The prosecution outlined the entire case that they had against Joseph, which included the CCTV footage of him riding around in the hours before the murder in Tullamore, not in Dublin or Blanchardstown. They discussed the eyewitnesses who literally saw the attack happened, as well as the confession. It also turned out that during the attack, Ashling did manage to scratch her attacker hard enough to get DNA under her fingernails, and lo and behold, the DNA was a match to Joseph. They brought forward all of the witnesses who we discussed earlier, from those who saw the attack to those hospital staff who treated him, as well as the officers who he confessed to. During the trial, there was also a witness who came forward who claims to have seen Joseph on the night of the murder. So, this witness was a friend of Joseph and his family. He was also from Slovakia and was working as a bus driver at this time. The man claimed that on the night of January 12th, Joseph arrived to his door, asking him for a ride home. According to the friend, Joseph had scratches all over his face and arms, and he was bleeding everywhere. He looked like he had just been in a very intense fight. He asked him about this, and Joseph told him that he had been in a fight with someone, but he wouldn't say who. The friend said, though, that Joseph clearly looked scared, and he wasn't acting like himself. He said that he agreed to give Joseph a ride home, and while in the car together, the friend asked Joseph what happened multiple times, but Joseph wasn't giving up any details. All Joseph would say was that he was scared, and he thought that someone might break into his home and hurt him. The friend also did notice that while riding in the car, Joseph was leaned over and looked like he was clutching his stomach. By the time they arrived to Joseph's house, he dropped him off and Joseph said that he would explain everything the following day. When the friend was asked why he didn't go to Gardy about the incident, he said that at that time, there was a lot of stuff going around social media about a Romanian man who was recently arrested and a lot of Romanians in the area were afraid. So, he thought that Joseph was attacked by somebody who hated Romanians. After all, he said that someone would be at his house to hurt him, and at that time, again, there was a lot of hate in the area for Romanians. So, to the friend, all of this made total sense. But, all this to say that what this witness saw confirmed that Joseph was injured on the very day that Ashling was also attacked and murdered. However, the defense came back with a very interesting argument. Once again, Joseph was claiming that he was stabbed by a random man. He said that the man was wearing a face mask so he couldn't identify him. But at this time, he said that there was a woman nearby and after the man attacked Joseph, he then went and attacked the woman. Joseph said that he went over to the woman who was just attacked by this random man before leaving the scene and going across the field and sitting in a ditch for a few hours because he didn't feel well. Then, as the witness said a minute ago, he said that he went to the friend's house asking for a ride home. After that, he went to his parents' home, who escorted him to the hospital. He was now claiming that not only was he not a murderer, he was actually a good Samaritan who wanted to help the woman, but instead, he became the victim of the same attacker. Joseph's defense argued that he had no memory of making any sort of confession in the hospital. As I mentioned earlier, when he arrived to the hospital, he underwent exploratory surgery. At the time, he was given morphine for pain management. In the days that followed, he was given small amounts of oxycodone for continued pain management. However, it turned out that Joseph had a past history of abusing pain meds. It is also known that opioid medications can have side effects including depression, drowsiness, anxiety, and brain fog. The defense actually claimed that he was under the influence of those opioid drugs when he made the confession. They said that he was under duress after being visited by the officers and that the medications he was on caused him to act out of character and confess to something that he did not do. They said he only confessed because he was really anxious. However, the doctor who took care of Joseph actually took the stand to dispel this. He said that he had only given Joseph a very small amount of oxycodone in the morning of the 14th. 
He said that by the time Joseph made this confession, the medications would have very little, if any, effect on him anymore. The prosecution also told the jury that Joseph was a known liar and he liked to make things up and that this situation was no different. However, the tough thing about this whole case was that they couldn't really come up with a solid motive. I mean, Joseph had absolutely no criminal history. He had no known issues in the past with violence against women, no sexual assault convictions, or anything like that. He also was thought to have absolutely no connection to Ashling. He didn't know her. He had never met her. He literally decided in that moment to randomly attack her in broad daylight in front of several witnesses. Some people thought that maybe he just snapped. Friends who knew him in the past said that he was always a very pleasant guy who is never known to have any issues with his wife or children or against other women. So, this happening was totally out of left field for Joseph. But in the end, the motive didn't really matter because of the confession, the CCTV footage, as well as all of the other evidence that we discussed. After three weeks of trial, the jury of 12 were sent off for deliberations. They deliberated for about three and a half hours before they came back with their verdict. They found that Joseph Puska was guilty for the murder of Ashling Murphy. For this, he was handed a sentence of life imprisonment. I'd just like to take this opportunity on behalf of Angada Shikana to note the conviction today for the murder of Ashley Murphy and the life sentence that has been put in place on Joseph Pushka. Ashley, a national school teacher, was out for a walk after work when she was attacked and murdered by Mr. Pushka. This monstrous crime shocked the nation. I want to pay tribute to all the members of Angara Shikan involved in this investigation, and in particular, my colleagues at Tullamore Gada Station from where the investigation was led. The investigation team were professional and steadfast in their determination that the person responsible for Ashley's murder would be brought to justice. I also most importantly didn't want to thank the community of Tullamore, a compassionate, kind, resilient and generous community. They were of invaluable assistance to Angara Shikana throughout this investigation, providing us in particular with access to CCTV, which was instrumental in building the case against Mr. Pushkin and to achieving a successful prosecution. The community also has and continues to support Ashling's family. Finally, I would like to pay tribute to Ashling's family, her mother Kathleen, her father Ray, her sister Amy, brother Carl, and indeed her boyfriend Ryan. The courage, the dignity, the resilience and the strength that they have shown during this ordeal has been exemplary. I want to assure them on behalf of Angara Shikana that we will continue to support them going forward and give them all the support we can where necessary. At today's sentence hearing, Kathleen Murphy said as a parent, you want your child to go into the world and lead a full and meaningful life, while also being aware of how fragile their safety is. Seen here after Yosef Pushka was convicted of Ashleen's murder last week, she told the court she couldn't protect their dream daughter from an evil monster and now she was gone forever. Amy Murphy and her victim impact evidence said her little sister grew to become the soil that kept their family and friends nourished with positivity, humour and hope, with her mother's warm smile and her father's cheeky wit and wink. She spoke of her siblings' love of life, of music, of teaching her first-class pupils, a young woman who drove her late granddad's red car with pride. Ryan Casey described their many happy years together as a young couple and of their many plans for the future, which have so cruelly been taken from them. He said he would never get to marry his soulmate and could not describe the pain of losing the most important person in his life, especially, he said, in such a horrific, senseless and just beyond evil act by such an insignificant, lowest of the low, 
waste of life. He said, I feel like this country is no longer the country that Ashleen and I grew up in and has officially lost its innocence when a crime of this magnitude can be perpetrated in broad daylight. Amy said it was hard to imagine her sister's bright personality being diminished strike by strike with each stab wound when her sister was randomly attacked by Pushka along the Grand Canal outside Tullamore on January 12th last year. Of course, this sentence brought some closure to the family. They can find peace in knowing that the monster responsible for taking the life of their beloved Ashling will rot behind bars. But obviously, this does not bring Ashling back. It will never fill the massive void that her absence has brought to the family. Her students who loved her will have to live on knowing that their beloved teacher is gone. Ryan will have to live his life knowing that the future him and Ashley planned for is no more, and her family will have to live knowing that Ashling suffered from the worst possible violence in her last moments. All of it is just unimaginable. 22 months ago on the 12th of January, 2022. From day one, the outpouring of love and support was felt in abundance from the Irish people, both on a national and international level, as they stood in solidarity with our family to both mourn the loss of our beautiful, talented Ashlyn and to condemn gender-based brutality with visceral repulsion. Ashlyn was a vibrant, intelligent and highly motivated young woman who embodied so many great traits and qualities of the Irish people and its communities. Her life had a huge impact on so many of those around her and she was the epitome of a perfect role model for every little girl to look up to and strive to be. She was not only an integral part of our family, but she was also a huge shining light in our community, a community in which, year in, year out, she gave back to as best she could. Ashley was subject to incomprehensible violence by a predator who was not known to her. While we do not glory in any conviction, we recognise the importance of holding accountable those who would commit such terrible atrocities. The judicial process cannot bring our darling Ashley back nor can it heal our words, our wounds. But we are relieved that this verdict delivers justice. It is simply imperative that this vicious monster can never harm another woman again. Of course, Ashling's murder absolutely shocked everyone in Ireland. People are pissed that women can't even exist in public without the threat of harm. One article put it so perfectly in saying that even when women take all of the precautions, going to heavily populated areas where there are people all around, being aware of your surroundings, none of that worked. Ashling was still a victim no matter what she did or what she could have done to protect herself. And it's just so devastating and infuriating. This should have never happened. It's tragic, it's heartbreaking, and it's just so, so disgusting. Ashling Murphy's killing and the circumstances in which she died shocked the country. In the days after her murder, vigils took place around the country and around the world. In her native Offaly, thousands turned out in Tullamore to remember her. And almost two years on, the pain is still there. Ashling's death certainly catapulted the response to violence against women, and it certainly did propel a response by by the whole of government that, um, like you said, she was only going for a run, that an innocent person could be attacked so violently. That has resonated a huge shock wave. And I think the shock is still there, to be fairly honest. And uh, people are still recovering from that. And if you talk to any young woman or any woman in the community, they will tell you that they're still afraid. And that fear will forever remain in women within our community. And I do think throughout Ireland, uh, I think it's quite similar. I think that Joseph was a predator and is still a predator who always had some sort of dark thoughts and fantasies and either had never acted on them or has never been caught up until now. I think that he was following women around that day, maybe even trying to talk to them and was either constantly getting rejected or he was just in a bad mood when he was following around those women and he couldn't understand why they would be afraid of him. Honestly, I don't know. I think he was a creep. I think he was following around those women for one reason or another. And I think at some point, something in his brain was building up and then snapped when he saw Ashling. And unfortunately, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
this literally could have been anybody. I think that he would have killed someone that day, no matter who it was. And unfortunately, Ashling was the victim of opportunity. I don't even think he was thinking about getting caught at the time. And then after realizing what he did, he left. I think that after going to the hospital and being questioned by authorities, he felt that the walls were closing in. I think he went to the hospital originally with those injuries to sort of explain everything off so that if anybody saw him out or saw him with scratches all over him, that he could explain it like, yeah, I went to the hospital, some random guy stabbed me. But as we could see, when he was in the hospital, he was getting really nervous. I think that after he confessed, he realized that he was going to be facing some very serious repercussions. I don't think he actually felt bad for what he did. I don't think he wanted to make it easier for the family by confessing. I genuinely just think that he was worried about himself and his own family, and he was scared of being caught. So when he felt like he was backed into a corner, that is why and when he confessed. Then again, he realized that he was going to have to face some very serious consequences and he no longer wanted to go to jail and tried to fight it. But thankfully, there was a lot of evidence against him and I hope that he stays in jail for the rest of his life. But after this, that is all of the information that I have on today's case. And let me say, this one was a very terrifying and interesting one. The fact that this man just snapped so suddenly and for seemingly no reason is just crazy to me. So, after hearing all of the details, I really want to hear your thoughts on this entire case. Why do you think this happened? Do you think that Joseph just snapped? Or do you think he was on the prowl looking for somebody to kill? What do you think caused all of this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.